If I've learned one thing over my time of watching anime, it's that each and every person who enters this medium has a kind of bar that signifies how deeply they've explored what it holds and how much further they're eventually willing to go. And each bar obviously has a different depth. Some people are willing to try more things than others, but with that bar, at the very, very end, past the Normie Shonen series, past the Flavor of the Month rom-coms, the sports series, the mecha, the pretentious, intellectual seinen, at the very, very end of that bar, for most people that I know, you have children's anime. Now, you would think that that would be one of the first things you watch, but obviously a lot of us only got into anime later on in our lives. At a point where we look at most kids' anime, other than obviously the ones that we grew up with, and say, EW! That's for babies! I'm gonna go back to watching JoJo's now. But I think that would be a very big mistake for a number of reasons, and the chief reason among those being that there is some damn good television that just so happens to be made for children, as I'm sure you must be aware of if you've watched some popular television shows such as, uh, I don't know, maybe the greatest western animated television show ever created? And I recently discovered that this fact of life spreads even overseas to the magical world of anime with a popular children's show known as Precure. Now, Precure has its own story and its own background to get into, but I want to actually begin talking about just this idea of kid shows as a whole and why a lot of them, at least the good ones anyways, still hold up as an adult and can still be enjoyed now. And it all comes down, well, to that demographic, to that audience that they're making these stories for. Now, you can obviously have these creators that just have absolutely zero passion for what they're making and end up creating very generic and very shallow experiences that they think kids are just too dumb to understand that what they're watching is actually garbage. And hey, maybe they are. Maybe they are too dumb to understand that. But when you grow up and when you look back on your favorite things that you watched as a kid, those are the things that just don't stick with you in the same way that the good things do. And I think what lets good children's television speak to people, even as adults, is this concept of taking these really complex emotions, messages, themes, storylines, and breaking them down into the fundamental components that lets even idiot children understand what they're watching. And I hate to keep bringing this show up, but it's just the gold standard for what I'm talking about, Avatar The Last Airbender. This show is a phenomenon that was originally made for children back on Nickelodeon in the mid-2000s, but has recently had a resurgence with all kinds of Zoomers and Millennials well past its target demographic who are still finding so much to love about this series, arguably even more than they would have as kids. And it's because Avatar does this beautiful thing where it takes these really heavy, heavy themes and subject matter and presents them in a way that is a lot easier to understand but doesn't take away from the meaning of those concepts themselves. War, betrayal, prejudice, love, your identity as a human being and accepting who you are, all things that have been tackled in much more mature and complex stories, all these big, grand ideas, but it's the fact that these writers were taking something so mature and breaking them down in a way where even immature kids could understand the weight of what they were watching. That is what makes this so special, and as an adult, I think it's especially refreshing to have these big, heady concepts being communicated in such a relatively simple and straight-to-the-heart way. And on the topic of hearts, that leads us into the very subject of this discussion. This is in fact not an Avatar The Last Airbender video, it's about something you actually probably have never heard of. A kids anime series that I recently discovered, enjoyed a lot, does everything that I just mentioned, and yes, as you can tell by the title, ended up making me cry on multiple occasions. Hard Catch Precure is part of the long-standing Pretty Cure anime series that has been on air in Japan 
pretty much every single week for the past 18 years. And I'm not gonna act like I'm some kind of expert on this franchise just because now that I've dipped my toes in it, but the biggest thing that I've learned while watching this series and also some other adjacent series is that despite this franchise for all intents and purposes being meant to be watched by little girls, I'm telling you right now that Heartcatch Precure is a genuinely great anime series that I think anyone can enjoy, and it's part of this mega franchise that I think has a lot to offer to more than just its demographic. Now, to understand what Hard Catch Precure is, we have to first understand what Precure itself is, but thankfully Precure is about as simple as it gets. Magical girls fight monsters and evil bad guys in order to protect the world. Y you gotta remember, it's a series made for children, but where the more interesting narrative bits come in is what these monsters are themselves and how they're used from episode to episode storylines. Now, from what I understand, this can actually be wildly different from each Precure series to another. The current Precure series right now, Delicious Party Precure, has the monsters be these kitchen appliance designs to fit with the overall food theme of that series. But what Harkatch does with these monsters is actually exactly what I think makes this overall premise and these storylines work so well. And that being that the monsters, these foes that our magical girls are going up against, are actually personifications of characters' feelings. They are quite literally their heart. Hence the uh, not-so-subtle name. You might already see where this is going, but the reason why this works so well, the reason why a lot of these stories can tackle interesting dilemmas, emotional plot lines, and heavier material, is because it's putting all of those things at the forefront of what the girls have to confront. Your standard hard catch episode involves the girls coming across some person who's having a rough time, a bad guy steals that person's heart and creates a monster out of that bad time, and the girls have to defeat that monster and help that person reach some kind of emotional resolution. Again, the way I'm describing it might come across as kind of simple and uninteresting, but that simplicity is what lets a lot of these deeper emotions be communicated as clearly and concisely as they are. Naturally, when you consider negative feelings that impact your everyday person, there are a lot of episodes, a lot of stories that involve feelings of jealousy, feelings of inferiority, feelings of heartbreak, lots of fundamental emotions that I'm sure everyone here has experienced, and they are executed for the most part with a very sincere and very impactful message. But one of my favorite early episodes of the series is actually a bit more extreme when it comes to what the character is dealing with and what emotions are tied to it. In episode 14, titled A Tearful Mother's Day, we get a closer look into one of the supporting characters named Nanami and her younger sister, which happens to be one of the heavier storylines in the series about this girl who's trying to fill the role of her mother who passed away for her younger sister who doesn't actually remember much about her. And this is just a really beautiful, really special episode about this younger sister who just wants to learn more about this mother that she never knew, and an older sister who's trying to suppress her own feelings and memories of her mother so that she can stay happy and substitute as one for her sister. And by the end, there's a wonderful resolution, a wonderful message to take away from the episode, and I explicitly remember it was the first episode that I teared up at in the series. And when I realized, that this silly magical girl show actually had a ton of heart. Now, there's many more episodes I could dive into specifically, but one thing that I really appreciate about Heart Catch is the way that it builds an overarching story in the background as well. Now, it, it's not anything hyper-focused or grand, such as, y you know, Avatar The Last Airbender, but along the journey, you'll notice a lot of seeds being planted, no pun intended, both in the narrative and the storyline itself, but also in this central cast of characters, and even some of the supporting characters, where they will gradually develop, go through small arcs, and reveal aspects about themselves that eventually culminate in much bigger and more impactful resolutions later down the line. Now, in the interest of not spoiling anything, I won't get too deeply into what those resolutions are, but I definitely have to mention them, because along with some of the climaxes scattered throughout, the back quarter of this series, the last 15 or so episodes, are almost all genuinely fantastic because of that overarching story and the way that you get so many great payoffs back to back to back. 
Of course, all of those payoffs would only actually mean something if the characters you're following are actually good, and... Well, I don't think you really need me to say it, but the characters in Heart Catch are one of the strongest aspects about it. Specifically that core cast, and even more specifically, the two main main characters, Subomi and Erika. I will be completely honest, Heart Catch would not be even close to as good as it is if it weren't for these two characters. They're immensely charming, immensely charismatic, they play off of every other character in the series so perfectly, they have their own arcs and journeys they go through themselves, and as someone who has only watched a few other Precure series so far, I'm going to make the incredibly baseless assumption that I just I don't think any other series in this franchise will have a dynamic and leading duo as strong as these two. And writing aside, these two obviously have very strong and interesting personalities, but what really elevates them is how those personalities are conveyed visually. And that leads into the last thing that I really want to praise about Heart Catch overall, and that is the production. Precure is a series that has been helmed by Toei Animation ever since its inception, and it's gone through a bunch of different identities and phases over the years. I honestly don't think that people realize how many incredible directors and animators have worked and even gotten their start on Precure before moving on to other bigger projects. And for that matter, I don't think people realize that some of the best and most visually impressive episodes of TV anime have come out of this silly Magical Girl franchise. And I say all that because Hard Catch, for being a 50 episode anime series, is actually shockingly consistent and very visually appealing. Hard Catch Precure has two big names attached to it that I would say are primarily responsible for it looking so good and it having the visual identity that it does. On one hand, you have Tatsuya Nagamine, the star director of Dragon Ball Super Broly and currently One Piece's Wano arc, who has been partly responsible for that series elevating into the Sakuga anomaly it is today. And on the other hand, you have character designer Yoshihiko Umakoshi, who previously had done the character designs for the 1997 Berserk series and is now the character designer for My Hero Academia. I would say that these two are the biggest voices on what this series is doing visually, and it stands out not just from other anime, but even among the Precure series itself, Hardcatch is considered kind of an outsider when it comes to its visual presentation and design work. This is a much more cartoony and abstract aesthetic than what Precure was known for at the time, and even what Precure is known for now, and I think that's one of its greatest strengths. I mean, Umakoshi didn't win a goddamn award for these designs for no reason. These are endlessly expressive, endlessly evocative characters, and even when the episodes aren't filled with crazy, over-the-top animation, it's these designs and how loose and off-model they're allowed to be that keeps this series visually interesting all the way through. Nagamine, on the other hand, has a knack for directing action and spectacle, as you can tell from his other works, and that is seen throughout most of Hardcatch's episodes as well, with each monster fight, each transformation sequence being super consistent and super, super fun. Overall, Heart Catch Precure is one of the harder things I've had to think of how to recommend. It's, it's not exactly something that has a super obvious hook or universal appeal. In fact, I I'm sure a few people might check it out after this video and come back to me saying, what the hell, you didn't tell me I'd have to watch the same transformations and finishers every single episode? And, and what is that fairy animation? What am I watching here? What did you make me watch? And what can I say, there's just some things that you have to get used to by virtue of it being this kid series made to air every single week. Also, yeah, the Heartseed animation is pretty cringe, but it's just one of those stories that has so much soul and so much passion that I really think this show will speak to a lot of people, and I hope that no matter what preconceptions you have about it, you're willing to open your heart and give it a chance. Thank you all for watching, join the Discord server in the description if you want to hang out and chat. I love you all, and I will see you in the next video.